Uh, we might get going, everybody. Thanks for attending this final talk for the day in the, the DevOps track. Uh, my name is Paul Brebner. Uh, as you can maybe tell from my accent, I'm not from the US. I'm actually from Australia, uh, from a little, little town called Canberra, which happens to be the capital city of Australia. Um, so it's actually really exciting being here in person finally. Uh, I've talked at the ATO event online a couple of times, so it's been, been great this year actually being here in person and attending some of the other really excellent talks. So, so I feel like my brain is full now and I can go back home to Australia and process everything I've learned and all, and uh, hook up with everyone on LinkedIn that I've, that I've met. So it's been a great, great event. Thanks to the organisers as well for the invitation to talk and thanks to everyone again for coming along to this session. Um, Canberra, yeah, it's, it's perhaps not the, the metropolis of the utopian sort of tech paradise that somewhere like Raleigh is, but um, one thing that was cool that we had at the beginning of last year was a drone trial uh, by a Google company. They decided to test out whether they could actually have a whole swarm of drones flying around the part of Canberra that I live in, delivering things like donuts and actually uh, more donuts probably, and small items under a kilo to lots of people that lived in the suburb. And these were pretty interesting. They were very fast. They kept on buzzing over my house. They were really quite loud, quite annoying, to be honest. Uh, but I saw them delivering donuts and things to my neighbors, and I thought, well, that's cool. I'm going to get their app, and I'm going to sign up and get donuts delivered uh, as well. And sure enough, I signed up and put in my address on the, the map, and they said, sorry, we can't deliver to your house. And I thought, well, what's going on here? You're delivering to my neighbors, but it turns out we've got too many trees and too many power lines and weird things like that, apparently. So I thought, well, okay, that's disappointing, but what can I do? Well, I, I thought, well, what I can do is actually build my own drone delivery system. Uh, it's only simulated. Someone actually asked me at the start of this, this talk whether there were real drones involved, and the answer is unfortunately not. Um, one of my work colleagues actually asked the same question. They said, do you know you need a license to fly drones around delivering stuff? And I said, well, it's only a simulation, so don't worry too much. And look at the size of the room. It's just like um, Doctor Who's TARDIS. It's, it's bigger on the inside, I guess, in here than I thought. You could almost fly a couple of drones around here, so I should uh, maybe bring a drone to the other uh, next iteration of this talk. So it's spinning on drones with uh, Cadence Workflows, Apache Kafka, and TensorFlow. I should just say I'm the open source technology evangelist at InstaCluster, now part of Spot by NetApp, and thanks to my new NetApp colleagues for coming along, who I've only actually just met for the first time a few minutes ago, so that's very exciting as well. Uh, so this is actually two talks. You're getting a double, sort of a double whammy here. Uh, it's a talk that I have given previously, but with a new talk added on. I thought it was worth, uh, worth combining it and having sort of double the content. So there's two parts, and those of you that know about bikes will notice something strange about this photo. Um, yeah, it's actually back to front, but I did that for artistic license. So part one is about cadence, Kafka, and drones. Part two is about uh, machine learning with TensorFlow over streaming data to do some predictions, hopefully. Our InstaCluster provides a managed platform. It's a cloud platform for big data open source technologies. Uh, and a recent addition, well, at the start of last year, uh, is a workflow orchestration um, engine uh, with Uber's open source Cadence. So this talk is about Cadence, Kafka, and TensorFlow, which is sort of bring your own. We don't provide that as a managed service, but it's easy enough to run uh, on, on a cloud um, environment and work with these other technologies as well. So part one, workflow orchestration. Well, it's a simple idea in theory. It's just about task ordering. You start a workflow, you perform some task, you perform another task in sequence, and then you end the workflow. What could be simpler? Well, it's actually a bit harder in practice. So doing workflow orchestration with cadence copes with a number of things. First of all, pedaling with a high cadence uh, in the bicycle world is called spinning, uh, which is fast spinning, uh, fast pedaling. Mashing or grinding is slow and generally a bad thing to be doing on a bicycle. And the same with workflows. Cadence is horizontally scalable. The number of workflows is essentially unlimited. Cadence is also fault tolerant. Workflows can fail and recover. And Cadence supports long-running and scheduled work workflows. So a lot of things in the workflow world, you need to run them at a particular time, and the workflows may run for hours, weeks, days, um, years, potentially. Cadence also has advanced visibility, so you can see what's going on inside the workflow world, basically. So workflow execution, 
um, visualization and search is supported in Cadence. And finally, work, our Cadence workflows are just code. So the developers amongst us will find this perhaps the most exciting thing. You don't need to learn some new language or some strange tool for visualization to build your workflows. You just have to write code. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, Java code is what I use. Um, here's a workflow implementation of two tasks executed sequentially. Looking at the Cadence architecture, we provide a managed service for the, the Cadence system. So basically that involves providing some servers that are provisioned automatically and that we run for you on a cloud provider of your choice. So that copes with the, the Cadence sort of back-end stuff. Um, and that includes the persistence layer, which is typically Cassandra or Postgres. Uh, there's also the ability to run Kafka and OpenSearch, which gives you the optional advanced visibility as well. On the front end of the system, um, as a customer or user of Cadence, you'll have to write your clients and run the clients and the worker code on your own infrastructure, talking to the, the managed Cadence service. Uh, the workers run the workflow logic, and currently Java and Go clients are both supported. Just looking under the bonnet a bit, this is perhaps getting a bit technical at this point, how does Cadence fault tolerance actually work? And the, and the scalability as well? Well, it uses event sourcing. So what happens is there's a state change history with replaying going on under the bonnet. So the state change history as the workflow is executed is written to a database. This is very efficient because you're only writing the change in state, not the complete state uh, at each point in time. And then if something goes wrong, if there's a failure in the workflow, the workflow state recovery is done by replaying the history. So the failure this causes the complete history to replay up to the point of the failure. And that recreates the workflow state at the restart point. Uh, read is somewhat inefficient, but hopefully infrequent. And sleep and schedule actually use the same mechanism. So um, I don't know, if, for those of you familiar with koalas, they really only have two states, a sleep. So you can put your workflow to sleep. Um, and then when you want it to wake up again and do the only other thing that koalas do, which is eat, uh, they spend most of their time eating, actually. Um, then you just recreate the workflow state as well in the same way that you would do if, if, if it had failed. Uh, an important concept in Cadence is activities. Cadence activities implement tasks. Uh, activities, including something silly like cycling backwards, uh, can and will fail. Uh, they're a core part of Cadence. They implement tasks. Remote calls in particular can fail, so you wrap them inside activities. They can contain any code with some restrictions. Activities are executed at most once and can be automatically retried on failure, but they must be deterministic. So there's a few tricks. Uh, there are some cadence-specific functions that you have to use for non-deterministic things like random number generation and getting the time and things like that. So what are some good use cases for cadence? Well, when you've got hundreds to millions of running workflows, long-running workflows uh, with sleeping and scheduled tasks, uh, stateful fault-tolerant fault applications, complex workflows, integration with unreliable external systems, integration with streaming and event-based systems, for example, Kafka, and when you've got relatively short workflows. So hundreds of steps in a workflow is okay. Maybe where you've got thousands of steps, uh, that could be an issue because it does take a lot longer to replay the history when, when there's failure or when you have to wake up a workflow and things. So some good examples of actual use cases. I mean, it came from Uber. On the Uber Eats side, that was about delivering food to people. That's how they actually managed the workflows around uh, drivers and shops and orders and things. Retail and, obviously, delivery, given its origins. So we're moving on to the next part of the talk, which is about the drone application that I built, Spinning Your Drones, a drone delivery application. So there's a number of steps in the drone delivery system. Uh, as illustrated by this diagram here. Basically, the, the drones are all hanging out together at some sort of base where all the drones live and they get recharged. Uh, when a shop says, oh, I've got an order that I'd like to be delivered, um, they fly to the order location, to the shop location, they collect the order, they then fly to the delivery location or where the customer is and drop the order off. They then fly back to base and recharge and just repeat. So the life of a drone is pretty simple at this point. So just an example maybe of some pirates that would like to get some donuts from a local village on an island before they go out hunting treasure. Um, this is an example of the flight paths involved. There's three legs. 
the drone base to the order location, the order location to the uh, customer location, and then back to base again. So what's going on while that happens is there's some waypoint flight calculations going on, basically. And here's an example of the final leg returning back to base. Uh, the drone flight path is computed inside an activity. Uh, it uses location, distance, bearing speed, and charge. And it's computed every 10 seconds, which is a bit arbitrary. It could be done faster than that. Uh, if something goes wrong, so if it fails, the drone won't crash and will continue flying from the last location. So just a bit of a sort of an overview using some swim lane type diagrams. Uh, here's the first workflow we'll look at, which is uh, about the drone itself. Um, so basically, it goes through a number of uh, tasks and state changes from the start um, state into the ready state, waiting for an order, uh, lots of movement activities between all the different locations, back to the base, recharging, and repeat again. But orders are also stateful, so I decided to implement them as a cadence workflow as well. So we've actually got two workflows in cadence for this demo application. So inside the, the order workflow, the, the order workflow starts. It actually generates the location that the order is going to be picked up from. Uh, it gets ready for the drone to pick up the order. And it then receives constant updates from the drone as the, the drone uh, comes and picks up the order and transports it. And then finally, the, the order workflow actually terminates completely if uh, the, the, the goods are delivered successfully. So the other interesting thing that you'll notice is that we, sometimes we might need coordination between more than one workflow, so coordination across workflows. And Cadence has this built in using an asynchronous signaling mechanism. So that works pretty well between specific uh, cadence workflows, you can send a signal from one workflow to another workflow, and that's really great for synchronizing activities, which is, is what I used uh, for, for part of the, the steps in this system. But what if you wanted to integrate with other systems, particularly other asynchronous systems? What can you do? Well, just to make life a bit more complicated for myself, and more interesting maybe and relevant to our customers, I decided to actually introduce Kafka into the equation as well. Now, Kafka is the technology that I'm most familiar with and most in, uh, excited about. Uh, you can use it to build some really quite interesting, nice, real-time streaming systems. So it sort of made sense to try and combine these two uh, technologies together. So in particular, integration with Kafka for this system adds the ability to start a workflow from Kafka and also using a Kafka microservice to coordinate the drone and order workflows. So I'll just go through the steps in a, in a typical... Uh, drone delivery. Step one, a customer places an order, maybe from some mobile phone app that results in um, a Kafka producer basically being called, which sends a message uh, to the Kafka new orders topic. The Kafka consumer then gets the order. It starts the new order workflow using a Cadence client. So that's the point where it interacts with Cadence. Step three uh, is where the order is ready for drone pickup. So this is done inside an activity. Uh, it sends an order-ready message to the order-ready uh, topic. Uh, step four is in the drone workflow. It's an activity. It sends the drone-ready message to the drone-ready topic. Uh, the Kafka consumer gets an order ID and sends a signal back to the drone to start the order pickup. So that's the coordination across the, the two different workflows. Uh, step five is in the drone workflow. It's where it first does the, the um, actual uh, location and flying calculations. It flies to the order location to where the shop is and picks up the order. Uh, the next step six is inside the drone workflow again. It's flying to the delivery location. Again, it's just done inside the activity where it does the, the waypoint calculations. Um, and then finally, when it gets to the order, um, sorry, the customer location, it drops the order. While it's doing this, it's actually sending location and state updates to the order workflow every 10 seconds as well. This is so that the the, the shop and the recipient of the order, customer, uh, actually can, can know where the order is. Uh, they can look at it perhaps on a map and work out when they've got to go outside and uh, watch the drone drop the, the package in their, their front garden and pick it up. Or they can perhaps get an ETA so they know when, when it's going to come. Step seven is, uh, again, in the drone workflow, it's flying back to base again. Um, 
Yeah, so it flies to the delivery location and then back to the base. It recharges when back at the base and gets ready to start again when required. So it just, the drone workflow actually really just loops around. It's the same drone and the same, it's a different instance of the workflow, um, but it's in a different state each time. Uh, step eight, there's also something going on in the order workflow while this is occurring. This is where it's receiving the update locations from the drone workflow. So state and location updates, in fact, using that signal mechanism that I talked about. Um, it updates the state and location information. And then finally, when it's successfully delivered, it ends the workflow. All right, um, just a bit of a higher level look at what's going on here. I decided this is some new content I included for this version of the talk. Um, it's sort of an architectural analysis of similarities, differences, uh, a, bit of, a bit of a look at difference in time scales, and also some performance results that we got as well. So first of all, similarities. Well, actually, oddly enough, Cadence and Kafka are similar in many different respects. So here's some that I've listed in this table here. Um, I mean, in particular, they're both scalable, they're both persistent, they're both reliable. Um, they all support asynchronous um, mechanisms. Um, they're both open source, and they're both available as a managed service on our platform, at least, and potentially others as well. Um, so they are, at some level, similar. Some of the mechanisms that are used are different, but at a high level, they're similar. Uh, they are also different, though, and potentially complementary as well. So Cadence is actually an example of an orchestration system. It's got synchronous or timed sequences going on inside a workflow engine. So they, ha they do have different architectural styles, and using a musical analogy, it's uh, the, I mean, orchestration is more like a conductor um, syn synchronously getting all the performers to perform in time from one single score. Uh, Apache Kafka, on the other hand, is a good example of a, a, a choreography system. It's typically asynchronous. Um, the events are independent of each other. Um, uh, that it's, yeah, it's, it's far more loosely coupled and asynchronous. But what if you combine them together? Well, you, sort of, you get a new type of architectural style, which I've called the ballet style. Um, essentially, you're getting the, be the best of both worlds, and you can have um, both uh, synchronous and asynchronous systems working together, uh, doing something new and, and more powerful. Another aspect is uh, the complementary timescales as well, so slow and fast. Um, so Cadence is sort of slow. Uh, it's got synchronous events, stateful flows, sequences. It supports slow and long running flows, supports sleep and scheduled events, and complex flow logic. Kafka, on the other hand, is certainly well known for being a fast streaming event-based system. It's got asynchronous events, stateless events, one-off events, fast instantaneous events, real-time processing, and complex stream processing using the Kafka Streams API. But if you do combine them together, you, you still get this idea of the, the ballet the ballet pattern, the drone ballet in this case. Um, so let's see how well it actually worked. How many drones can we fly? Just some performance results that we obtained. So we're just running the whole system on a fairly small lot of uh, clusters. The total cores is 32. Um, the client code was running on eight cores. Cadence itself was running on six. And Cassandra was taking up 18 cores. That is probably the, the, um, the most demanding part of the, the system, still is the persistence layer. And when we did some load testing, we managed to run 2,000 drones concurrently. And taking into account that there's actually 2,000 orders running as well at the same time, that gives you 4,000 concurrent workflows from that size cluster, which is pretty good. Um, yeah, just virtual though, they simulated. So 4,000 drones flying overhead would create quite a racket, I suspect. Uh, just a brief visualization. This was done in JavaScript, um, receiving the Kafka events from the Cadence engine. And you'll see what happens when it's sped up. This is uh, assuming that my backyard in Canberra is the drone base, uh, which is the purple blob. The drones are the black blobs flying initially to the orange shop locations, uh, and then eventually as well off to the red delivery locations. And when a delivery is successful, the, the red blob should turn green, hopefully. Yep, that seems to be working correctly. Now, there's quite a lot going on here. 
Um, so you will notice uh, some locations are busier than others, so some, some shops may be busier than others. There's a lot of data, in fact, being produced by the system, and it's all, it's all real-time data as well. So that got me thinking, well, what else could I do with, with this platform now that I've got it? Um, there must be something else that's of interest that we can, can explore as well, which leads into the second part of the talk. I'll just wait till the final drone gets back home, which is done. Okay, so part two. So let's have a drink at this point. Yeah, this is the, um, the back end cogs on the bike, which are a bit faster than the, the front cog normally. So Kafka plus machine learning with TensorFlow over spatio-temporal drifting streaming data. How easy can it be? I don't know. We'll see. So the goal is to predict which shops will be busy an hour ahead of time. So busy shops um, will need more resources to cope with a larger number of drones over a particular period of time, and also they need to have more goods to, to deliver. So it would be good if we could warn the shops when, uh, when they're more likely to be busy. And being not busy is a bit boring, and yeah, they're going to go out of business at that point. Uh, Real-time machine learning is basically everywhere now. It's pretty common. TikTok um, is sort of one of the examples that inspired me to think about this application. They use Kafka and real-time machine learning to make sure people watch the videos that will keep them addicted to the platform in real time, more or less. And cat videos apparently are the thing that, which people um, still like to watch. Um, so some of the challenges around incremental machine learning are things like big data, where you've got lots of data. Fast data is streaming. New data is constantly arriving. It's not static at all. Uh, it's changing data. And possibly you can actually have concept drift, which is when the actual rules change on you. And it's just-in-time learning as well. So it's continuous learning. The model must be up to date all the time to be useful. And finally, streaming data is infinite. So you can't assume access to all the past data. There just isn't enough storage in the world for that to be possible. <clears throat> so in particular, the drone learning problem, using the drone delivery system I built, it generates massive amounts of spatio-temporal data. The drone order data is sent to Kafka. And can we learn how to predict which shops will be busy an hour, an hour before? Here's the architecture. So the simulation produces lots of data. Um, basically, the drone and order state and locations data. Um, I bolted Kafka streams onto the end of the, the order workflow. That computes aggregated hourly shop and order details and, and then categorize it into busy and not busy. And that's then sent to TensorFlow. Uh, back to CATS briefly. Uh, TensorFlow is actually a modern neural network framework which supports incremental learning. So it was a good fit for doing this experiment. Um, turns out that, I mean, um, Neural networks have been around since at least the 60s, and I recall looking at them in the 80s and thinking they were pretty old-fashioned and of not much interest anymore, but they've certainly come back again, and they're quite, quite powerful for certain types of use cases. So there's a number of experiments that I did. I'll just quickly summarize the results as we go forward. Um, this was pretty experimental. I didn't have any uh, expectation of what the outcomes would be. And I did the experiments over a period of, of a, a period of time and tried improving things incrementally. So I was learning about incremental machine learning incrementally. So experiment one was basically using still data, so batch data only, with no concept drift. So the simplest possible data set that I could think of to try and make sense of. There were 6,000 samples over a period of a week. There's not a lot of samples in machine learning. Typically, you have millions, billions, trillions. The class to learn was whether the shop was busy or not busy per hour. The class and features are computed from hourly aggregated delivery shop data. Other features uh, that were present in the data included the weekday, shop type, um, average delivery time, etc. Uh, time was quantized to hours and location to a suburb. So essentially this was cheating and probably, I mean it simplified the problem but may well have meant that um, it introduced some oversimplification as well. Uh, and the rule is a combination of shop type, location, weekday, and hour. So what's that? So there's four features that the, the rule of being busy or not busy depends on. Here are the steps to train a TensorFlow model and then use the model on, on new data for prediction. Uh, there's, yeah, there's about 10 steps. Um, 
the, the details are in the blog. I'll give you a link at the end of the talk to have a look at the details. And the code is there, and the data is there as well if you want to try it out yourself. Perhaps the most interesting point is that in step eight, every time the fit method is called, it actually updates the model. So it doesn't um, start from scratch every time you give it new data. It's actually doing incremental learning by default, which is excellent for what we want it to do. So when you evaluate um, machine learning models, there's a number of things you can look at to see whether the, it worked. And accuracy is typically the, the metric that people use. But it can be misleading un unless you have roughly equal positive and negative samples. So I cheated. Um, I made sure that my class actually was 50-50, basically. So, so again, another simplification. Here are the initial results. This is, again, for one week of drone delivery data with shop busy, not busy. Yeah, 50-50 split, as I said. Um, training accuracy improved during training from 0.5, which is just guessing, to 0.88, which isn't too bad, over 125 epochs. And again, I also used the um, confusion matrix to look at the results, just to make sure that it was actually um, as good as, as the accuracy metric was suggesting. And yeah, it confirmed that essentially the model was doing quite well. The true positives and true negatives outweighed the, the false positives and false negatives significantly. However, I did notice the results were not repeatable. The accuracy actually varied from 0.5, which is no good at all, to 0.9. Uh, and the training time also varied from 5 to 92 seconds as well over various runs. Uh, it's also highly sensitive to batch size and the number of samples used per epoch um, also was variable and 32 seemed to be the most consistent result that I could, could use. And sometimes it gets stuck in a bad local minima, which means you're just not going to get sensible results at all, unfortunately. So experiment two, let's see whether we can do better. This was the first attempt at actual incremental learning, but fake, basically. So I still wasn't using Kafka. I was using the original data with TensorFlow, just talking to the, basically loading the data. Um, and there was no drift present in the data. So the goals, I wanted really to be able to see whether I could do continuous model training from streaming data. Uh, with incremental learning, you don't need all the data. Um, and the model has to be updated all the time, if possible. So useful for real-time use cases. Uh, and it should, should be able to cope with concept drift in the data eventually. So that was what I was really trying to achieve. And that's why we started looking at the incremental aspect. So this the experiment, too, used the same data as last time, but using incremental learning, um, sort of faking it using TensorFlow. Oh, OK, so here's the approach I used. I sliced the data to get 100 samples at a time. So that's simulating what you would get from a Kafka poll from a Kafka topic. Um, I then fit with each of the 100 samples. I had a batch size of 8 and 20 fixed epochs after a fair amount of fiddling around with, with trying to tune things. And then I evaluated the model against all the previous data. So here's the results. Uh, and there's a few, a few of these graphs you'll see. Basically, it's, it's learning over time, which is the bottom axis, and the accuracy on the, uh, the vertical axis. So 0.5 is just guessing. 1.0 would be perfect. Uh, we never get there, but we get close. So first of all, you'll notice, well, the accuracy does actually improve over time, which is a good thing. Um, the maximum accuracy is comparable with batch learning. But there's this crazy oscillation going on. Well, what's, yeah, why do we have oscillation in the accuracy? That was a worrying thing. Um, we'll come back to that in a minute. Experiment three was actual incremental lear learning using Kafka. Uh, and oddly enough, that mean the results were actually slightly different and slightly better. There's not as much oscillation for a start. The accuracy was comparable. Um, I've said here it's a bit worse, but I mean, it was sort of in the same ballpark as the previous experiment. Um, so yeah, so the incremental learning does work. It, it, there's still something weird going on. Experiment four, uh, just to make life harder, I used incremental learning plus Kafka plus introducing a concept drift as well, which was what I was hoping to achieve. So what happens is uh, the concept drift is introduced at this, the end of the week one, at the start of the week two of data. So I'm using two weeks worth of delivery data at this point. I assume that at the end of week one, the rules basically change. And something happens to the world, which makes some shops busier than others, which is different to the previous, previous week. Maybe, I don't know, a certain type of ice creams in fashion all of a sudden, or some other product is more of more interest to, to customers. Or the location might be the thing that, that matters all the time of day, or a whole bunch of things like that. It's just a different, I use a different set of rules for the second week to 
for the first week. Um, so the first thing you'll notice is the accuracy instantly drops to a lot worse than guessing. So the, because the model thinks it knows what's going on, suddenly it's presented with data that doesn't make any sense. So at that point, it's actually doing worse than, than guessing. However, uh, because it's using incremental learning, it can try and improve itself. So it starts immediately trying to improve the model again, and it gets back up. In fact, it um, performs better at the end of the second week than it did at the end of the first week. So it's not doing too badly. It's actually doing quite well. Um, we've still got this oscillation, though, which is, um, at the time, it was a mystery. Uh, another experiment, I decided to try and reset the model after the drift. This is the well-known trick. Um, so basically, if the model accuracy drops too much, you just reset the model and start from scratch again. You just give up, basically. So retrain, retraining using only new data helps because it removes the pre-drift model inertia that the model has at that point. You just assume that the previous data is so different that the, and, and you need a new model starting from scratch. Um, this helps immediately in this case. The accuracy went up to 0.9. Um, but there is the continued oscillation again, and the ac accuracy actually starts dropping during that second week as well. So that's another mystery, if you like. Um, using the same model um, without the reset, yeah, that, that shows you what the, the result of the previous experiment was in blue versus the orange graph there. So eventually I decided to really try and understand why this oscillation was going on. I asked a few of our machine learning gurus in our company, even though we're like a sort of a cloud um, DevOps company, we actually have quite a few people with PhDs in machine learning from the local ANU. Um, so I had a talk to them and showed them the data, and they said, um, yeah, there's a few, thing, few things going on here. So it, it turned out we had accidental drift already, even before I was introducing it on purpose. So even though the rules weren't changing originally, the data itself was changing over time. Why? Well, because primarily because we had temporal features, particularly the day of the week and the time of the day, which we used to determine whether the shops were busy or not busy. Um, and some hours actually had no, no busy shops at all. For example, at the end of the day, there were none of the shops were busy. So the model was more or less thinking, oh, I'm wrong, but it was actually the data that something had changed in the data, but not the rules generating the data. <laughs> so yeah, so there was, it's a bit complicated, but. And the other thing that apparently is an issue is time bias or fixation. So incremental learning may result in a temporal bias due to fixation on recent samples, and also because you are learning um, in the time stream itself. So you are at a particular point in time, and that means you are fixated more or less on the recent samples as well. And that may mean you go down a bit of a rabbit hole, unfortunately. So what our experts said, well, basically you're doing model overfitting. So oscillation is a typical symptom of, of model overfitting, and it's well known problem on machine learning over time series data. Um, so I've discovered something that lots of other clever people knew anyway. So, um, so when you've got time series data plus incremental learning, yeah, you end up somewhere strange and hard to understand. And a couple of the challenges around learning over spatio-temporal data include things like time encoding. So default time encodings typically have temporal discontinuities or time wraparound. So midnight and midday, you basically go from the number 12 to the number 0. Uh, TensorFlow doesn't know that 0 and 12 are actually close to each other, because they appear to be not close to each other. So sometimes you have to, to re-encode time for, for the learning to work. Another problem is periodicity and repetition. Uh, that's quite common in temporal data. Um, and, and in physical systems, so like ocean waves have both temporal and spatial periodicity. So there are various tricks, apparently, that you can use to um, cope and actually do prediction over data with um, repetition as well. So I thought, well, this, at this point in time, I knew I had problems with learning over the, the um, temporal data. What if we just get rid of time? That's a fairly simple hack just to see whether my suspicions were correct or not. So, so I'm not recommending this. You can't really get rid of time. And, and when you're doing machine learning over um, spatio-temporal data, you can't just get rid of the time because it really is important. But just to prove the case, I got rid of time. So here are the no time results. And guess what? There are no wild oscillations anymore. So it was pretty obvious that the os oscillations were being called by the, some of these issues around the, the temporal aspects. And uh, with the model reset, um, there's a big drop in accuracy initially. That's perhaps what you'd expect because it is starting from scratch again, it's just guessing. Uh, but it's slightly better 
by the end of week two. So it does improve and is doing okay by the end of week two. Now in production, you could actually continue using the old model until the new one is trained up or even having more than two models potentially. So you could have models competing with each other and make a decision about which one you want to actually bring into um, production with the training being done sort of incrementally and continuously at the same time. Uh, yep, how are we going for time? That's right. um, so just some sort of high level conclusions. So incremental learning is actually quite fast. It's one, one advantage of incremental learning. You're only learning with a relatively small amount of data each time. So it should be possible to keep up with streaming data in production. You, you, you will need to resource your um, machine learning um, resources adequately to cope with that, but it should be possible. Uh, incremental learning is able to keep the model up to date, more or less, in conjunction possibly with resetting the model as well. And model accuracy may oscillate due to the presence of time features, fixation on recent data, changes in sample class distribution over time, concept drift, and goodness knows what else. <laughs> it's complicated. Overfitting on time series data is something to certainly watch out for and is a well-known issue, and you should take action to try and prevent or mitigate it. And one thing I am thinking of doing, and has been recommended again by some of our gurus, is to use rolling or sliding windows to try and flatten these oscillations out. So yes, bring in the steam roller and your problem may just magically go away. Uh, and also what I suggested, try multiple competing models concurrently. Um, and there's also the potential, I think, with cadence, and again, I haven't tried this, but you can use cadence workflows to actually uh, manage and run the machine learning ops side of things as well. I mean, it's just a workflow engine, uh, so you could actually um, tie um, the whole machine learning process into the, um, the cadence workflow system and actually get that to, to do it for you. So that would be pretty cool, I think. That would be an interesting experiment to try. Uh, spatial temporal bias is inevitable in the real world. Observations are always from a single point in space and time. You only directly experience the here and now and can only inspect past events, not future events. So there are restrictions around, around learning, no matter what people will, will tell you. Uh, you may have more luck than I do. Um, so we actually have a free trial available for two weeks. Here's a, just a screenshot I took of our website, instacluster.com. Um, so if you go into the, the free trial button, you can spin up a Cadence cluster and a Kafka cluster and bring your own TensorFlow. The data is on the GitHub uh, as well as all of the blogs that, that talk about this as well with a bit more explanation about how you actually set up TensorFlow and the different options to run it for some of the experiments I did as well. So yeah, you may have more luck than I did. Um, it's worth giving it a go um, and br bring your own data as well. You may have some more interesting um, realistic data that you'd like to, to do some machine learning over. And that's all from me. Um, that's the link, my LinkedIn um, QR code there, and the link to our website where you'll find at least 100 open source blogs that I've written over the last six years, plus some from my colleagues as well. Um, there's a lot on Cadence, just um, focusing on Cadence. There's a lot on Kafka. Uh, there's a whole series on, on the drone story as well. And we're always coming up with new use cases and testing out different technologies and writing about how to use them and things that we've learned. I mean, we don't, we're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. We start out not being experts, and by the end we sort of know a bit more maybe um, than a few other people about some of the technologies, but uh, it's always a learning experience. And we always try and expose some of the things we've discovered and mistakes we've made along the way. So hopefully that's a benefit to the community and of interest to people as well. So that's it from me. Thank you very much.